you. Again, basic, basic stuff, but I need you to be clear before we do these interventions so that you don't like get mixed up in your mind. That airways all the way down to the alveoli is for air, and then all those little tiny capillaries all around on the outside of the alveoli are your blood flow. So you start out with the pulmonary artery and then get really teeny tiny capillary level around the alveoli, and then it goes back into the pulmonary vein to the left ventricle. It's the only artery vein in the body that are mixed up and that the artery brings deoxygenated blood to the lungs and the vein takes oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left ventricle. So it's the only one where things are backwards and that's because we're taking blood away from the heart. It's an artery, but it's deoxygenated blood. And then we're returning blood to the heart. It's a vein, but it is oxygenated blood. So it's a little mixed up. But So if you think about, and this is the piece that I really want you to really know. Because if you know this piece, you will understand why we have all the problems that we do. Here is the one capillary. Every alveoli has its own little capillary going right next to it. So this is the little capillary with oxygen, deoxygenated blood. It goes past the alveoli and leaves with oxygenated blood. So if there is no blood flow, if that's cut off, we don't have oxygenated blood leaving that alveoli. And you see how thin this membrane is? This is the vessel wall and this is the alveoli wall. It's two cells thick. So it's very easy for things to get across it. It's only supposed to have oxygen and carbon dioxide crossing it. But when this gets engorged with blood, because maybe the left heart's not pumping well, and so now all the blood's backing up here, and this is engorged, and it's got about 10, 12 blood cells in it instead of one, what is going to happen? <coughs> Fluid's gonna escape across this small little membrane and into this air sac. And that's how we get pulmonary edema, is fluid escaping out of these capillaries and into the air sac, into the air sac. So normally, there should be no fluid in the air sac, there should be no air in the blood vessels. But fluid under high pressure can escape and that's where it'll escape to, to that big empty chamber that's just supposed to be filled with air. Um, otherwise, that's normal, and that's what's supposed to happen. So what if this alveoli is full of mucus? Are we exchanging? Not really, because air can't get in past the mucus to exchange. Blood's moving past it just fine, but air can't get into the alveoli. So the more alveoli that we have compromised, the more problems we have with gas exchange. So there are a couple of different diseases. And then this is one more piece of anatomy. Here's all the little tiny alveoli with all their little capillaries around it. And then we have a couple of sacs around the lungs because all that blood flow is sitting on the outside of those alveoli. We don't want that blood flow getting mixed up with anything or if those capillaries break, we don't want any bleeding. So we have a couple of membranes in here and they are plural membranes. The inner one just kind of holds everything together. And the outer one, there's fluid in between. It's called pleural fluid. We have it. And why do you think we have fluid in between the two membranes? Right. This hurts after a while. You rub your hands together, it'll get hot, it'll get red, it'll get irritated. So we have a little bit of fluid in there too, just like a joint, just to help keep things moving smoothly. So we have pleural fluid in there but we don't have very much, and if it expands or if it swells or there's more pleural fluid in the pleural membrane, we have a problem with that. So just kind of, if you are getting confused as we go through all these things, those pictures, I think, hopefully are helpful. Um, I'm not gonna re-review the respiratory assessment, but if you have um, respiratory problems, I would like you to check all of these things in your respiratory assessment. So any patient with a respiratory disease, respiratory history, <laughs> or any kind of respiratory problem at all, these should all be in your assessments. Um, and this is the basic lung assessment. So I'm not gonna spend more time with that. Um, just some word, if we say dyspnea, that means just difficulty breathing. 
So it's a cinnamon, cinnamon, cinnamon. It's a synonym of shortness of breath, right? Shortness of breath, dyspnea, same thing. We would always, if a patient is short of breath for any reason, ask, is it with activity or is it with rest? Because we all know that dyspnea with rest is a worsening condition than dyspnea with activity. And then you could even break it down to hard activity. Of course, it's normal to get dyspnea if you're working out hard. But um, so ask your patient, do you get dyspnea when you're walking? Do you get dyspnea when you walk up a flight of stairs? There's a lot of differences there. And they can help us figure out if a problem's getting worse or not. Um, do we all know what clubbing means? You remember that from block two, right? What does that mean? It's a constant state of lack of oxygen causes changes in the nail bed, known as clubbing. So if you see someone with clubbing, they have been in a persistent chronic state of a low oxygen flow. Um, always mental status changes. Whenever your patient's confused, we usually check ABCs first. When your patient's confused and they don't have a history of dementia, we're going to go, are you getting enough air? So I think I've told some of you the story about the patient that held us all hostage by needlepoint because he was hypoxic. So he was, we left, so this nurse left needles up. We used to have bedside things right next to the patient's thing. They were these tall dressers with had all our drawers in them and anything. She left two needles up on the top and was doing things, left the room. And then we came back, she's standing there like this. <laughs> all out of bed with two needles kind of, they had to have security come up and disarm him from the needles. And then um, she got him back into bed, put his oxygen back on. And like an hour later, he's like, I did what? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> just so you know, it's kind of like finding out how you are when you're drunk, <laughs> finding out what you're like when you're hypoxic. It turns out I get really panicky when I'm hypoxic. So like after surgery, I was like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. She's like, if you're talking, you can breathe. I'm like I can't breathe. <laughs> Everybody gets a little bit nutty when they get deprived of oxygen. Um, so confusion is kind of sometimes, if you don't have a pulse ox on, one of our first clues that something's not going right with oxygen. It could be perfusion as well. It could be heart. But basically not enough oxygen getting to the brain makes you a little bit on the loopy side. Um, so there's that. Um, I'm not going to go over ABGs. We have done ABGs. You should know ABGs by now. Um, and then there's all the other tests that we could um, do. Chest x-ray, CT scan, MRI, sputum cultures, and then have you seen a bronchoscopy yet? That's where they put the scope down um, into the lungs and actually take a look at the airways. It can't get all the way down to the alveoli, but it can go pretty far down into the branches. They can look at the airways um, to find out if there's uh, stuff going on. So I would stop real quick and just say there might be a little question or two on what would you worry about post bronchoscopy after we shove a camera into their airways. Well, bleeding. Whenever we put something somewhere where it doesn't belong, we worry about bleeding. But one of the things is these airways are real sensitive to any foreign objects. And so after a bronchoscopy, they may have some swelling in that area, especially if they went in and kind of suctioned it out really good or did a biopsy or did any kind of procedure during that bronchoscopy into very delicate airways that are very hyperactive anyway and very sensitive, um, they could have swelling. So we would want to be on the lookout for any kind of edema or bronchospasm after a uh, bronchoscopy because if that person's got a hyper airway, they could close it up after that irritation. Of course, we worry about bleeding, and how would we see it? They can pop up blood. So a little bit of pink is not unusual after a procedure. So remember, for any procedure, whether it's bladder or bowel or anything, a little bit of pink is okay. They went in there and they scraped stuff up. So a little bit of pink is perfectly fine. That's some irritation, some swelling that's coming up, and we're getting rid of it. A little bit of pink is okay, so especially if they did a, a cystoscopy and now they're, now they're peeing a little bit of pink. Anytime we stick a camera somewhere and the discharge is pinkish, then okay, we'll watch it for a little while. But bright red, not okay. So if they're coughing up pink stuff, that might not be a call, but you keep an eye on it in case it starts getting darker or more. Um, but anything pink normally okay, but we'll watch it for a little while. If it doesn't stop after a couple hours, 
or it gets darker. We would let somebody know. And then, of course, the other big problem is that we're going into airways. We could poke a hole in them. You'll see when I pull out my pig lungs there, they're pretty delicate. I, could, I was worried about poking them like the whole time that I was playing with them. Um, and so if you poke a hole in the airways or the lungs themselves, what do you think is going to happen? It's a balloon. It's gonna, every time you breathe in, air is going to move out of the lung and into the space where it shouldn't be. So we will see some problems um, with a pneumothorax, possibly, or something like that after surgery, after bronchoscopy. So there are three things to look for after a bronch. Um, irritation of the airways, causing bronchospasm, puncture of the airway or lung tissue, or bleeding. Okay, so three things to look for after bronchoscopy. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the mass, but what I have been seeing in, um, in sim and stuff is that, just that sometimes there's a little bit of confusion about what all the masks do. So I just wanted to reiterate um, the amount of oxygen that you get from each mask and um, what that will do. If you can just remember that the flow coming out of the wall is always 100% oxygen, 100%. What makes it change is the amount of air we're mixing from the room with that 100% oxygen. We can't change the amount of oxygen coming out of the wall unless we put a dial on something. Um, so the oxygen coming out of the wall is 100%. Uh, so when you're giving two to six liters of nasal cannula, when we go up to six liters, we're just increasing the flow of 100% oxygen, but we're not changing the amount of oxygen out of the wall. But when we breathe in air around our nose and our mouth, around that nasal cannula, we're diluting down the oxygen. So if more 100% oxygen is getting in, we dilute it down a little bit less. But these are don't, that's why there's a range here. There's not a guarantee that you're getting 35% oxygen. If you are taking 100% oxygen out of the wall, six liters nasal cannula, and you're going, <sighs> you're mixing with a lot more room air. So um, that might get diluted down. To something. So six liters nasal cannula is not a guarantee of 35% oxygen. There's no direct correlation. It depends on how much room air you're mixing in with each breath. Um, so that's a, these are basic things. The Venturi mask, have you seen these Venturi? Do you remember these Venturis? These are things that regulate the amount of room air you're mixing. So as soon as you put a mask over their face, you're, dilute, you're reducing the amount of room air that gets to your patient. So you get higher levels of oxygen. <coughs> Um, and so these Venturis will take the 100% oxygen coming out of the wall and mix it with a certain amount. The window allows only a certain amount of room air in. And so you, get, you can more precisely regulate the control of the oxygen. Um, high flow nasal cannulas are things you see at the hospital. They can actually give flow up to like 60 liters per minute. Can you imagine? That actually puts a lot of pressure. If you're putting, that puts a lot of pressure in and helps pop the lungs open a little bit more. And it feels really good if you feel like your oxygen starved. And if you're delivering 100% oxygen at 60 liters per minute, you're really puffing on oxygen in, a lot less dilution going in there. We can control um, the, the oxygen a lot better. So they can dial up the oxygen levels. The respiratory therapists usually control this. It's a separate machine that sits at the bedside and it has an oxygen amount and a flow amount. And it's just more precisely controlled higher, but it goes through the nose and these patients are getting, they're getting like tons of oxygen up through their nose. It's almost like bagging the nose. And so they can exhale out the mouth, but they really are not exhaling out their nose because there's so much pressure blowing into that nose. Um, and if you're starving for oxygen, 60 liters a minute, you're like, you don't even have to take a breath in. It's like the air is just getting pushed into your nose. It feels really good for patients, but it's also support. Um, let me just point out one more thing that I kind of talked a couple of times about in the exam. Oh, can we borrow the oxygen for a minute? The difference between a non-rebreather and a partial rebreather are these discs. Do you see these discs on the side? If you do not have the discs on, you can inhale room air through the holes and it will dilute down. So we can get up to about 80% on a partial rebreather. And the reason it's called partial is because we can, we're not getting 100% oxygen. We're partially mixing room air with it. So if you're, if you're breathing in, you're sucking room air through those holes and diluting down the amount of oxygen you're getting in. The bag doesn't have anything to do with it. 
The bag is just an oxygen reservoir so that with each breath you're taking a huge amount of 100% oxygen. This is just an oxygen reservoir. So any oxygen that comes in that you're not breathing right away will sit in here. It doesn't hold CO2. It doesn't do anything for hyperventilation. It's an oxygen bag to hold the extra oxygen as it comes in. Um, so partial rebreather is no disc. And then as soon as we put these little rubbery discs on, then every time you take a breath in and suck in, you're sucking those discs closed and you're inhaling only the oxygen out of the bag. You're not getting any room air in there and so you're guaranteed 100% oxygen because you can't mix any air. So those discs are what make it 100% non-rebreather. If you don't have the discs on, it's only a partial rebreather and it will probably only get up to about 80%. And that's because we're diluting down the oxygen out of the wall. So I just needed to say that piece because I saw it being like kind of still confusing and I didn't want it to be confusing to you all. So you know what you're grabbing. Any oxygen, they call a simple mask or whatever, you can see that the simple mask has a lot of holes in it. So the more holes, the more ability for room air to get into the mask, the more diluted your oxygen is going to be. The less holes, the less diluted. And so you can't guarantee any percentage of oxygen unless it's fully controlled by some kind of amount off the wall. But everything off the wall is 100%. So I've divided all of these lung diseases into classifications so that you can kind of see if you have asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, or cystic fibrosis, these are problems in your airway. And the reason I grouped them like this is because our treatments are all the same for almost all airway issues. So the treatments will be the same for airway disease. Then we have blood vessel disease. So this is a problem in perfusion to the lungs. Then we have actual alveoli disease, so something's wrong in the air sacs, not in the airways, but in the air sacs. There's something in the sacs that are causing problems breathing. And then we have actual problems with the membrane, which are those two, vest those two cells between the capillaries and the alveoli. Something's wrong in that membrane, the oxygen exchanging membrane. So if you see pulmonary fibrosis or sarcoidosis or ARDS, those are a problem with the actual membrane. So um, you can kind of see where airway diseases, what do you think we're going to use to treat those? Bronchodilators, mucolytics, things to get junk out of the airway and things to open the airway. If we have a blood vessel disease, what are we doing to treat those? Something to keep the blood moving. Blood pressure meds, heparin, whatever we need to do to keep the blood moving around. Um, and we could probably even, if you wanted to, put cardiac disease in blood vessel disease because that's going to cause problems in our blood vessels. Um, so if you wanted to put cardiac failure, that would be where you would put it. Left heart failure could be under there. Alveoli disease, this is stuff in the alveoli. So usually overproduction of mucus in the alveoli or um, alveoli collapse or fluid in the alveoli or junk and mucus and pus in the alveoli. So that means it's in the lower areas. The airways may not be affected at all. <coughs> it's just the alveoli. And this is where you see, oh, diminished bases. That's what, that means that the alveoli are full. Um, and then the membrane diseases, the only one we're going to be worrying about for the test, and they're highlighted in yellow, are ARDS. And then we've got problems in the space between that, those two pleural membranes, where we should just have a little bit of pleural fluid to to cause, provide lubrication, we've got stuff in there that shouldn't be in there. And that's pleural space disease. So I'm going to blow through all this because you should have had all this in block two, but it's a little summary in case you haven't had it. So you can read through those. And if you don't know what COPD is, I kind of drew some pictures there of you. And you can see why it's called air trapping. I like this picture. This is airways are producing too much crap. Probably because those alve those little veli are gone or whatever. And so this mucus plug just causes some air to allow in. But then the, the walls collapse and the air gets trapped in there. And it just keeps circulating. And then it becomes exchanged. And so now it's a big ball of CO2 that can't get back out. So it just traps air in there. And then when the lungs kind of release, all that CO2 comes out. But they end up trapping all the time. Um, so anyway, I'll let you review all these. They're not on the test. Um, and this is just a review of how to treat them. 
airway diseases. It's mucolytics and bronchodilators, steroids, all the things you would expect. Um, PE, just a couple of pictures of PE. Um, you can see it depends on where the embolus is as to how much damage there is in the lung. The higher up in the big blood vessels to the lungs it is, the more drastic of an oxygenation problem you can have. So you can have just a little shortness of breath and no other symptoms at all if you have a PE down here and that's it. Only this part of the lung is kind of like an, a heart attack. The higher up into the left main or that widow maker you have a heart attack, the more heart you lose. The same thing with the lung. The higher up, the more lung you lose. If it's just down in one of those teeny tiny little capillaries, you may have no symptoms or just shortness of breath. So it depends on where the um, embolus is. And then pulmonary hypertension, you can see just basically collapses all that circulation and makes it tight. And when you have pulmonary hypertension, the blood can't really get through very well. It's too tight. So you have a lot more risk of which side of the heart having problems if the pulmonary vessels are way tight the right heart will start having problems pumping against all that pressure. So that's why they're clear lung sounds. It's a blood problem. Blood's not getting to the lungs very well, and that gives us clear lung sounds. And then medications will be something, either vasodilators to open up those lungs or to the lung vessels. Not Bronchodilators won't do anything for a vessel disease. The airway is just fine. You take a listen to them, you're like, wow, air is changing really well. But my PO2 is really stinky. Then they'll probably do a vasodilator trying to open up those lungs, or they'll do an anticoagulant to get rid of any clots. And of course, oxygen. Oxygen goes for, that's like, it's an airway problem. They're going to get oxygen. Um, <clears throat> these are just all the different alveoli diseases. You should have done atelectasis before, but these are collapsed. Lungs, so you'll see our lungs when we, when we puff them up will be collapsed and then we will puff up the lungs and you'll see what they look like um, when they are not collapsed. And then we have pulmonary edema and I showed you the little x-rays. So here we have lung water has escaped out of this space. It's gotten into the alveoli. When the alveoli don't get air in them, they will start to collapse. And then that fluid is now filling the space around it too, if fluid is still escaping. So pulmonary edema starts with filling the sacs, but then as the sacs are full of water and they don't get air into them because air doesn't go through water very well without a lot of pressure, um, air will just, that, those alveoli just collapse and they just kind of stay like little water balloons and they just kind of hang there full of water, no air getting in and so they collapse there's no air to puff them open, and then fluid will fill in the area around the alveoli. So it starts to look patchy because there's all these little tiny alveoli just hanging there with their little water balloon selves. If you think of them as little water balloons, that might help you imagine what the alveoli are. You have about 50 billion water balloons in there. And yeah, they're hard to open, but once you get them open, they fill up pretty well, but once they collapse, they are really hard to get back open again. So we wanna make sure they stay open and out of fluid. But here's all the, the um, pulmonary edema, what that looks like. And let me just make sure that, okay, common causes. And I'm not spending a lot of time on the existing or worsening cues because you can kind of read those. Um, I'm gonna let you put those into your cards. I don't wanna spend time reading slides to you. And then if you have water and crap in your alveoli, what do you think we're going to do to get rid of it? Diuretics, antibiotics, why antibiotics? Is that going to get rid of fluid? Infection. It's going to get rid of infection. Any fluid in a warm, moist, dark environment is going to grow bacteria. So um, diuretics and mucolytics, why mucolytics? Get that junk up. Get that junk up. I was going to let you listen to my lung sounds when I had pneumonia. I was amazed. I was like to record it myself because I was like, <laughs> you could hear the popping. It was like snap, crackle, pop. As I took a breath in, you could hear everything popping, popping, popping because air was trying to get through all that junk. Um, I, I was like, wow. <laughs> when I wasn't thinking that I was going to get admitted to the hospital, put on a bed, and everyone was back to see me. 
I was like, oh, what hospital can I go to? Oh my god, we have students in almost every hospital. I'm mean, gonna have to go to a hospital where we don't have students. <laughs> These are the things I think about when I was in a fever induced state. <laughs> um, but anyway, really, diuretics will help get that fluid out because if we pee out a ton of fluid, the vessels will be dried out and we will. Um... Oh. Hang on. The Kahoot is playing. Let me silence the Kahoot. Like, there we go. Okay. Um, so these things are all around mobilizing that junk out of there. So if you have pneumonia, we should encourage coughing. Get that crap out of the alveoli so that air can exchange. Um, get everything out of there. The only thing that will really help is getting the crap out of the lungs and getting... Um, the fluid out of the lungs. You've got to get it out. And the only way out is for us to cough it out. So when you have an airway problem, the interventions are, or lung problem, our interventions are get the crap out of there, whether it's COPD, whether it's ARDS, whether it's pneumonia, whether it's atelectasis. Get up, get moving, walk around, take deep breaths, suction. Suction is not necessarily something that you need an order. So this is your airway. There are a lot of understood air orders around the airway. I've gone to CRTs where the patients like, you walk in and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. and I'm like, suction, the patient. They're like, we don't have an order to suction. And I'm like, it's your airway. I will give you, an, sorry, it's an understood order. To clear your airway, whatever you need to do to clear your airway is allowed and forgiven. Because if your patient's going to deoxygenate because they need oxygen or because they need suctioning, that's, that's not okay. Don't let your patient lose their airway because you're waiting for a call back from the doctor. Oxygen and suctioning, we forgive. Most no doc will argue with you when you call and say, hey, I went ahead and bumped up the oxygen or I put them on oxygen and I suctioned them or I did something to help their airway. Well, I didn't write an order for that. Well, okay. I've never heard that. Never, 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 never. Airway, taking care of your airway is an understood thing. Um, so yeah, there have been a lot of times where I've arrived and they're like, oh yeah, we didn't suction. Well, then you can't cough strong enough to get rid of that junk. And the only way to heal this is to get the stuff out. Um, so sometimes we can, uh, we can suction the patient and, a lot, you know, there is stuff that we're like, mm, oxygen and suctioning, go for it. Just go for it. It'll be okay. Um, there's other things. Humidify any oxygen over two liters. Do you need an order to humidify? It's an understood order. That's gonna dry things out. A lot of high flow air is going to dry things out. So if we're trying to get secretions out of the lungs and we're just putting dry air in there, that's gonna turn them into big boogers in the lungs, dried rocks that can't come out. So we wanna humidify anything over two liters. Adequately hydrate your patient. Make sure they either have fluid running or that they are drinking because you can hydrate to get secretions. If you don't hydrate, big, thick, chunky stuff that won't come up. Um, chest PT, pat the back. Did you learn chest PT? Did I already argue about this with you guys, about how nobody's teaching chest PT anymore? Just pat on their back. It feels really good. feels really good. And nobody will argue with you. The patients love it, and it moves secretions. So if you're turning a patient, and you're holding them on their side, did they, they didn't teach chest PT at all? Like cupping and, you've probably done it if you have kids. Yeah, lay them on their stomachs. Yeah, you just lay them on their stomachs and do a little cat move, Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you're not gonna smack with your hands, you're gonna hold your hands kind of like this. And make that sound. Go practice on kids and family at home. Yeah. They will all, Love it. And if you get down into the bases and you do it really hard, and it doesn't, because you're not smacking them with the tops of your hands, okay? You're not just banging people. You've got your hands in kind of a C, and I don't know if you've heard, you know, you've got cupping. Well, they used to call it cupping. It's not the same as cupping for muscles. 
and where you're trying to suction. This is just a cupping motion so you're not, you're not beating people. Um, and you're doing this and go home and practice it because I guarantee you your patient after you do this will cough and It is great for them because you are doing to the basis of their lungs Maybe someone who's in a lot of pain or someone who can't breathe well enough to generate a big cough Very helpful to mobilize those secretions and stimulate a cough and you'll do more with the little cough that they do if you've already broken up some of the secretions in your bases. Um, so yeah, any to go home and cut people, chest PT, it doesn't hurt, and people are like, don't stop. You used to do it with your kids and make them say, ah, and you're like, ah, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, that is a huge, huge thing, and I don't know why it's gone away. They used to have um, vibrating vests that we'd put on people. They would do um, percussion vibration so that they would percuss with the little, they have a little thumper, respiratory has a little thumper machine that they will put on and it'll thump their chest. Don't they do that for the ventilator patients? Well, we have to do it on ventilator patients. They don't have, they can't generate their own cough. So we have to get their own lung suction. Because when you suction, you're only going right here. You're not getting down to the alveoli. You have to bring secretions up into those bronchi bronchial airways so we can suction it out. So any amount of suction you do, respiratory therapy, ask them if they have chest percussors. They're usually just little um, little vibrators that they put on, or they're not really vibrators, they actually thump. But they'll thump and then vibrate. So if you can thump, 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 release some things up and then vibrate a little bit, um, it really makes a big difference in your patients that are immobile or not as mobile as they can. So I wanted to put a little plug in there for chest PT. We can all do it, does not require an order. Okay. Um, upright patient positioning as much as possible and ambulation if they can. That's all part of what we call pulmonary toilet or pulmonary hygiene is keeping these lungs as clear as possible. It is appropriate for any, dis any airway disorder. Moving secretions is great for any airway disorder, but especially important when those alveoli are full. When those alveoli are full, we have to get the junk out of there. Um, what else do we have? Then there's these membrane diseases, which is where the alveoli themselves become scarred and inflamed and swollen. And what do you think happens if your alveoli membrane is hard and inflamed or swollen? Is oxygen and CO2 going to be able to exchange across it? No, it becomes a barrier to exchange. So pulmonary fibrosis with scar tissue in the alveoli space, those alveoli just aren't exchanging at all. Kind of like if we knock out a kidney tubule, there's no waste getting thrown out of that tubule. It knocks out that alveoli. We could probably lose quite a few of our alveoli before we start becoming short of breath. But once we start becoming short of breath, we've got a lot of alveoli that have problems. Um, if these two cases are autoimmune, and so there really is no treatment for those. But the next one that we're going to talk about is our big temporary one. This is not an autoimmune disorder. Um, this one is a disorder of the membrane, and this is where something has happened, whether it is trauma, whether it is sepsis, and a massive immune response, could be just ended up in multiple or organ dysfunction, could be just too much pulmonary edema has crossed that membrane and has damaged the cells there. Um, but these damaged membranes basically don't hold anything back. And everything just floods. It's like opening the floodgates. The alveoli become damaged and fluid just leaves those capillaries in droves into the alveoli. So it is pulmonary edema throughout the whole entire lung. And it's because all of the alveoli got attacked and damaged or ruined somehow and um, causes a widespread leaking of all of those alveolar capillaries. So the alveoli just fill up all at once. Um, and it usually happens, and like I said, you're not gonna walk at home and get ARDS. Um, but usually it's a severe inflammatory response to something bloodstream-wise, a severe respiratory infection. I thought I was going into ARDS, because you know, <laughs> nurses when they get sick get paranoid. So, um, you know, I'm sitting there feeling and I'm like, ah. I'm getting pulmonary edema. I can feel it. 
but it's not widespread throughout the entire lung. <laughs> but it can, in elderly patients, if you get a pneumonia, can spread throughout the entire lung. It's just basically the whole, the whole lung gets swollen, edematous, breaks down the al alveoli, and then those alveoli just flood with fluid. Um, so it has to be usually a pretty significant trauma. Do not memorize this, but here are all the different phases of it. You can see everything's fine here. Then fluid starts to cross. And all of these things that are crossing here with the fluid start damaging the alveoli, and the alveoli just disappear, the alveolar membrane. The blood vessel membrane is staying intact here, but the alveolar membrane is gone, and things then pass through it a lot easier. Um, so that is kind of all the different stages of ARDS. And once this is all damaged, okay, hey Doug, do you mind just kind of, I have the computer set up. Um, once the alveoli is completely damaged like this, it's not going to really well rebuild under that circumstances. So we are constantly infusing that alveoli with fluid. Let me give Doug his computer. There you go. I had to call an assistant. I, I did restart the computer and it was updating. And it was like at 0% for a while, so I just left it updating. Um... Okay, so how do we know that we are starting to develop ARDS? So remember, this is widespread edema in the lungs. What do you think you're going to hear and see? So right up there. You're going to hear fine crackles because these are just the alveoli, but you're going to hear them where in the lungs? In the bases, everywhere. You're going to hear crackles all over the place. Not just in the bases. Fluid is gravity dependent. So usually, if we have pulmonary edema that's not ARDS, we will hear the crackles in the bases. Um, if you're starting to hear crackles all over the lungs, that is suspicious. The first signs are tachypnea and tachycardia because we're trying to get things moving around. They're starting to be deoxygenation, fine, fine crackles, and shortness of breath. Very vague symptoms. I had those symptoms as well, so I was sure. <laughs> I was like, I'm short of breath. I get, the, I get up out of bed. I'm short of breath. I can hear my crackles. I'm going to have ARDS. But that could also be the signs of just pulmonary edema. But you can hear them throughout in all lobes because there are crackles in all lobes. You get a chest x-ray, what do you think you're going to see? White. You're going to see white. So the beginning chest x-ray, this kind of end chest x-ray, the beginning chest x-ray looks more like, where are these? Go back, go back. I want to go back, not forward. Back. This is what a beginning chest x-ray of ARDS looks like. Do you see all the fluid? Mm -hmm. Everywhere. It's not big collections of fluid. It's just fluid around all these different alveoli sacs. So it says, you know, it's starting to get whited out. It looks like, wow, there's fluid everywhere, but little bits of fluid everywhere. So when I got my x ray, there was only fluid right here. So it was, they were like, you're fine. Little tiny pleural effusions, but not big ones. This is ARDS, this pleural effusions are everywhere. So really, our signs and symptoms are not specific for it, but when you see tachypnea and tachycardia and hearing crackles all over the place, especially in someone that probably doesn't have any reason, had a sudden sickness, it's something that you want to really be suspicious for. And you get a chest x-ray, and the chest x-ray will confirm or deny whether you have the um, ARDS, because that is what it looks like early. And then later, we start getting into, now it's starting to get really full. And it's starting to get whiter and whiter and whiter throughout the lungs. And this one is actually where it's gotten so white that all of it has just filled the bases. So all that fluid is now just kind of draining down and filling up this whole area here. So once we, um, you have, you're hearing fine crackles on someone. Remember, these are not patients with pulmonary disease. These are patients that have, were septic, maybe have an, you know, or trauma, or had some kind of quick, fast thing that you're like, what the heck? 
I shouldn't be hearing crackles. They don't have lung failure. They don't have pulmonary hypertension. They don't have any reason to have crackles. That might be a, something that you would worry about. You're hearing crackles all over on a patient that doesn't have any reason to have crackles. Um, Tachypnea and tachycardia. So those are your real big signs right there. And that's just something that's to be suspicious in patients that have sepsis. And then you're like, well, if they have a severe respiratory infection, I would expect crackles, right? You would expect decreased faces. If you have pneumonia, do you expect to hear crackles with pneumonia? What does pneumonia sound like? Yeah. It should sound consolidated. That's an infection in that area. So remember you say A, B, C, D, and it sounds really like, is it muffled or resonant? I think it's resonant like when they have pneumonia. Um, it, it may not be crackly, so it's certainly something that you would want to watch out. Crackles, and then you would only hear it in the lobe that's affected. So right lower lobe, right middle lobe, left lower lobe, whatever no lobe is infected. But you shouldn't hear it up in the right upper lobe if you have a left lower lobe pneumonia. So if you had a pneumonia and now all of a sudden you're throughout all of it, you had trauma, you have sepsis, and now you're hearing crackles, that is something that you should get a chest x-ray and look into. And so, of course, your patient that's tachypneic and tachycardic and septic, well, those all go together. But the crackles are a little bit unusual. Okay. Get the x-ray. And then if um, it's not confirmed right away, the patient will progressively get worse and worse and worse no matter what you do with their oxygen level. So we can put them up to 100% non-rebreather and their oxygen level is not recovering. It's because their alveoli are all filling with fluid, so there isn't a whole lot of... Um, a lot of air exchange going on. Of course, crackles and rails as the fluid, the lungs fill, fill, fill. Um, of course, cyanosis, and then we have trouble breathing. And so they start using their accessory muscles to breathe because they're worn out from trying to fill these wet lungs with fluid. What do you think we would do for this diagnosis? A massive, massive pulmonary edema. Oh, I would love some antibiotics for that. Look at that wet, juicy lung. <laughs> <laughs> so, antibiotics, diuretics, and mucolytics. Same as pulmonary edema, we would want to get rid of the fluid and um, get that fluid up as best we can. Um, antibiotics, of course. So, same three meds. Um, but the problem here isn't so much that we got to get rid of the fluid. We do need to get rid of the fluid, but that's is so much fluid that we have a hard time controlling what we need to do. So the, most of these patients, and they're getting hypoxic, right? We're on 100% non-rebreather and they're still satting like 88%. Their PO2 is low. And we will talk about this in the respiratory lecture. The next thing we need to do is provide pressure into the lungs because we need to push the oxygen in past that, past that fluid so that it can helpfully exchange. So we now add pressure ventilation so that we can push oxygen in past the fluid, which of course is going to make it bubble more, and we're going to hear worsening crackles and stuff. But basically we are taking a ventilator and pushing air in past the fluid to try and get it to the, alveo to the, the alveolar wall to exchange with that vessel. The alveolar wall is breaking. Can you imagine how much trouble we're going to have getting that oxygen across? But we're going to do it under pressure. Give those antibiotics, give the diuretics, give the mucolytics. We're going to do all of that chest PT. We're, we've got a lot of fluid. This is pulmonary edema times five or 10. So we're going to definitely be trying to get rid of secretions. And then if those things are not getting us air, we will prone the patient. Have you seen the rotoprone bed in your critical care clinicals? Yes. Unfortunately. This is where we flip the patient on their upside down and they are face to the floor. And why do you think that would help? So all of our fluid, our lungs are small in the front, wide in the back. They're kind of like little pyramids, little triangles back there. But we have a lot of heart in the front, rib cage in the front. So they're narrow in the front and they get wider towards the back. And the back of our chest is wide lung. So what we want to do is move the fluid away from as much of the alveoli as we can. So when we put you face down 
face to the floor, you are allowing air to rise. Fluid falls, air to rise. So all the fluid will fall forward and then air will rise to the backs of the lungs which have more alveoli. So if you're laying flat on your back, you're only oxygenating the front parts of your lungs which are narrower than the back part of your lungs. And we have all that fluid just kind of laying in the backside. So when we flip a patient upside down, we aerate more of the lungs. It's basically just moving the fluid around. Um, and this is sometimes the only thing that oxygenates the patient, is putting them face down. Um, and that bed allows you to lay face down and rotate, which of course mobilizes secretions. So that's basically all we're doing is removing as much fluid as we can from the lung space and just dumping it forward. It also takes the weight. If you're laying flat on your back, you have all this chest weight pushing down the heart and all of its blood vessels and everything are pushing down on the lungs, reducing your ability to get those lungs open. And if we face forward, everything hangs down and the lungs have more room to expand. So prone positioning is probably our last step. Um, there's a lot of problems with putting someone, imagine, face down. They are usually ventilated. We don't do this unless you're ventilated. Um, they are usually heavily sedated. And can you imagine laying face down when you are very, very sick for long amounts of time? Not only are all your organs facing forward, you get a lot of swelling in your face. It's, it's very uncomfortable to lay face down for a long period of time. Um, so these patients are usually intubated and heavily sedated to be in the prone position. But we're doing this because it's the only way we can get oxygen to the backs of their lungs. Um, so ARDS, remember, be suspicious if you're hearing, if you're tachypnic, tachycardic, and crackles on a patient that has got a severe illness and no reason for them to be, you know, they don't have heart failure. They don't have a history of any kind of lung problems. They're, they should be fine. And now we're hearing crackles throughout all the lungs. And remember, that's different than pneumonia or pulmonary edema in one lobe. This is throughout the entire lung. Um, we'll try to get pressured oxygen to them, give them their diuretics and antibiotics and mucolytics, and we will keep them moving. And if things are not working, we will put them in the prone position. There you go. You can take care of ARDS. Um, they can manually prone a patient, which is where we physically turn them over on their stomach. Um, and then this is a picture of the actual rotoprone bed. Um, and this is the picture of the patient. I'm trying to figure out where the patient is. Um, these are shoulders here. So this is the back of the bed. So they're laying face flat this way. And so this is a, looks like a big, huge thing because when you're laying upside down, you don't want to fall out of bed. So there's all these restraints to hold you steady while you're facing the floor. So there are a bunch of pillow cushions. And if you've ever seen someone pack or unpack the rotoprone, it looks like, you know. But basically what you're doing is you're flipping them upside down and then they take the back parts and open up the back parts of the bed so you have some airflow around the skin and things like that. And they flip them back onto their back every few hours to do skin care and do a skin assessment and check things out. And then once everything looks good, they put them back in the prone position. So what they do is they'll prone you for like five hours, then flip you up onto your back for an hour. We have had patients who are so badly full of fluid and so little air exchange that when we flip patients backwards onto their back, they'll code because they lose all their oxygenation as soon as we flip them on their back. So it depends on how quickly and how soon you can intervene and get them in the prone position. Um, but sometimes patients cannot tolerate being on their back at all. You can also keep these beds up at an angle so that they can aerate a little better. So you'll see people on their stomachs but feet kind of down on the floor and head up and circulating around so that we're basically trying to keep all that fluid to the front and then to the bottom so we can try and aerate and exchange. As the lungs heal or scar, we'll find out how much oxygenation that we can keep. Like basically this ARDS has damaged almost the whole entire alveolar membranes in all of our alveoli. So we'll prone for a couple of days when they go back on their back and they don't start losing their oxygenation, we leave them on their backs for longer and longer and longer and prone less and less 
to try and wean them from being prone. And as they start to heal and as the diuretics work and the antibiotics work, then they'll start to heal a little bit. But it's going to be a while before these patients get full oxygenation back. All good? Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. So let's take a